Welcome to this guide to the First World War battlefields trip. Um, this guide is just going to take you through some of the different places we're going to and just teach you some of the history um, about the First World War as well. So the First World War lasted from 1914 until 1918. Now at the time it was known as the Great War, but subsequently became known as the First World War or World War One. And the war um, was a tragic, tragic, tragic event, um, which you'll get a real sense of um, when you're out at the battlefield and um, probably killed around 20 million people. Now, in terms of the battlefields of the First World War, these are some of the unit sizes of the British Army, just to give you a guide that when we're talking about things like platoons, companies, battalions, and some of the different positions within the British Army, what they actually mean. So I think that's just a useful guide for you to have. And this is a map of the different sides in the First World War. So you can see that the two sides are known as the Allied Powers, which was primarily Great Britain, France, Italy and Russia, Italy joining the First World War a little bit later in 1915. And they were fighting against the central powers, which are Germany, Austria, Hungary, and um, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire. Now, of course, um, there was soldiers from across the world um, that fought in the First World War um, because of the fact that many of these European countries, particularly Britain, for example, had empires. So there were many soldiers that came to fight in the First World War from across um, across the world. So this just goes through the First World War year by year. So in 1914, um, it was the 28th of June, 1914, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, triggered the events that result in the First World War. Um, declarations of war took place in early August. Um, on the 4th of August, August, Germany put its military plan into operation, which was known as the Schlieffen Plan. Germany invaded through neutral Belgium and as a result Britain declared war on Germany because they actually had a peace treaty called the Treaty of London signed in 1815 which guaranteed Belgian neutrality. Now from the 7th to the 18th of August the British Expeditionary Force arrived in mainland Europe um, and early battles were things like the Battle of the Mons, uh, Battle of Tannenberg and there was an allied counter-attack on the Marne followed by German retreat um, which led to a stalemate and in September and October we had an event known as the Race of the Sea, um, where trenches began to form along the Western Front. And the first Battle of Ypres uh, was um, in October uh, 1914. Now, on 29th of October, that's when Turkey entered the war on the side of the Central Powers. And of course, the 25th of December 1914 was a very famous informal Christmas truce, which occurred on some sections of the Western Front. So a little bit of a focus on the Schlieffen Plan. The idea of the Schlieffen Plan, named after German military general Alfred von Schlieffen, was that Germany would take France by surprise by attacking through neutral Belgium and basically would um, kind of outflank um, Paris and um, take France really, really quickly. The plan was to, to um, take control of France really, really quickly. And then Germany would then send its forces east to fight against the Russians. So the idea of the Schlieffen Plan was for Germany to avoid a war on two fronts. It didn't work. Um, the, uh, the German forces got bogged down in Belgium um, and this is where these line of trenches um, therefore um, ended up being constructed on the Western Front and Germany ended up fighting a war on two fronts um, both in the West against France and Britain primarily and in the East against the Russians. So more offences began in 1915 in places like Artois and Champagne. The first Zeppelin raids took place in January 1915. There were um, German U-boat attacks, which are submarines on Allied and neutral shipping, and a declared blockade of Britain began um, in February 1915, leading to you know, problems of food shortages and things like that. The Allied attack at the Dardanelles in Gallipoli um, over in Turkey began in February 1915. And there were a few battles like the Battle of Neuf Chapelle. Britain began to blockade German ports, which was a really important tactic. Um, for bringing out about Allied victory. In April 1915, the Second Battle of Ypres uh, began, um, first use on the Western Front of poison gas by Germany. The RMS Lusitania was sunk in May 1915. So there was lots and lots of shipping that was sunk in the Atlantic Ocean during the First World War. It was in May 1915 that Italy entered the war on the Allied side. Um, the Prime Minister of Britain, Herbert Asquith, formed a coalition government in Britain on 25th of May 1915. And then there was the Battle of Luce in September 1915. Now, in December 1915, a really important event was Sir Douglas Haig became the commander in chief of the British Expeditionary Force. 
a much maligned character, sometimes uh, referred to as the Butcher of the Somme for the events of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Um, on 26 December 1915, Allied forces withdrew from Gallipoli in Turkey. So we saw about Douglas Haig becoming commander in chief of the British Army in 1915. A little bit of a focus on him. Um, he lived from 1861 until 1928. He was a senior officer of the British Army and he commanded the British Expeditionary Force on the Western Front from late 1915 until the end of the war. He was actually the commander during the Battle of the Somme, the Battle of Arras, um, the Third Battle of Ypres and the German Spring Offensive and the 100 Days Offensive in 1918. So in 1916, a few battles here, Battle of Verdun, Battle of Jutland, Brusilov Offensive, um, T. Lawrence, or sometimes known as Lawrence of Alabria, led an Arab revolt against the Turks in the Hejaz region in June 1915. Um, the Battle of the Somme took place in 1916 with 60,000 British casualties on the very first day of fighting, the single worst day in the history of the British Army. Uh, Army. Um, in, on 27th of August, Hindenburg and Ludendorff became the new commanders of the German Army. Um, Germany suspended U-boat attacks in the Atlantic Ocean on the 31st of August. Another important event in September 1916 was that tanks were used for the first time at the Battle of the Somme. Um, Germany resumed its U-boat attacks in the Atlantic Ocean, and this would be a key reason for the Americans joining the war in 1917. Um, Fort Douaumont was back in French hands after the Battle of Verdun in 1916, and the Somme ended in 1918. Now, in December 1916, the Asquith government in Britain ended and David Lloyd George became the new prime minister um, and the end of the Battle of Verdun was in December 1916. Okay, in 1917, uh, Germany launched full unrestricted submarine warfare, leading to the USA cutting diplomatic ties. Britain passed the Zimmermann telegram to the USA, which detailed a German proposal, proposal to Mexico to form an alliance against the USA. The Russian Revolution um, began on, in March 1917, although in Russia it's known as the February Revolution. Um, and other key battles during this time um, were things like the Battle of Arras. Um, obviously, America um, entered the war in April 1917, on the 6th of April 1917, really important event. Um, on the 31st of July, the Third Battle of Ypres, sometimes known as the Battle of Passchendaele, began. Um, and the Second Battle of Passchendaele began in October 1917, um, which is part of the Third Ypres. Um, there was an armistice between Russia and the Central Powers on the 17th of November. That's after the uh, Bolshevik Revolution in Russia um, in, in October 1917. The Battle of Cambrai began um, on November 1917 and Russia entered its peace negations, negotiations with Germany in December 1917 at Brest-Litovsk. So just a bit of a focus on the Battle of Passchendaele, fought from July to November 1917 during the First World War. Brutal campaign near Ypres. Um, British and Allied forces led by Haig sought to capture the Passchendaele Ridge from the Germans. And the battle is known for the absolute terrible weather, which turned the battlefield into a muddy quagmire. And despite initial gains, the Allies faced, ger faced fierce German resistance and suffered huge casualties, around 400,000. And the high cost and limited gains highlighted the horrible challenges of trench warfare in the First World War. So in 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed between Russia and the Central Powers. Germany's last gamble began uh, with the Kaiser's offensive um, and Germany advanced uh, quite far in April, May um, in Ypres, um, in Aisne and in Le Mans. Um, but there was the counter-offensive launched by Marshal Ferdinand Foch, um, who was the French uh, military general. And in August 1918, Haig commanded the successful Emian offensive um, and Germans were driven back to the Hindenburg line, which seems the black day of the German army. And American soldiers really making a big difference here. And um, by October 1918, Germany, um, there was a revolution going on in Germany in October 1918. Germany sued for peace. Eventually, the, the German king abdicated. Um, and um, you can see here how the armistice was um, was came into effect on the 11th of November uh, 1918 at 11am and that was the end of the First World War. And just a few maps of the First World War, you can see the Western Front here for example uh, and some of the, the key things and then it just shows you a bit of a map of the world and all of the different countries that were, were basically involved um, within the First World War. You can see here the fact that um, empire countries were kind of involved um, meant that this was a truly world war. And here's another map of the Western Front just for you to see some of the different um, kind of battles that were going on. And we're obviously going to be looking at um, Ypres, um, which is up in Belgium, um, right towards kind of like the top of the, of the trenches 
And here's a little map of the Ypres area in a little bit more detail. So a few of the different places we're going to be going to, like Poplarange, for example, Langemark, um, Passchendaele, where that is, Hooge, Sanctuary Wood, um, Hill 60, for example. So see, these are some of the different places that we'll be going to. Um, and Ypres, obviously, really, really important. OK, so there's just a little bit of historical context about Ypres. Um, so a more sacred place for the British race does not exist in the world, is what Winston Churchill said about Ypres. Now, Winston Church wanted Ypres to be left obliterated as it was at the end of the First World War as a monument to the sacrifice of Britain. Um, that wasn't done. And you can obviously see Ypres now. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful city and they've rebuilt lots of parts of it. Uh, most British troops who fought on the Western Front spent some time at Ypres. So it's a really important place to visit to learn about the experience of soldiers during the First World War from Britain. So just in terms of a bit of historical context about Ypres, um, Ypres stood in the path of the planned invasion route the sweep through Belgium and into France as set out by the German military plan, the Schlieffen plan. Um, and as we've seen already, this was a plan to attack France via Belgium to bring, bring about a rapid um, defeat of the French, which would allow um, the German military to then fight against the Russians. Now, Ypres was vital to British supply lines and during the First World War, it became symbolic of allied efforts to hold back the German advance. Ypres was under almost constant shelling during the First World War, um, and there were four major battles there as well. So the first Battle of Ypres was October to November 1914, and this battle took place during the closing stages of their, quote, race to the sea. The British wanted to protect channel ports and keep open their supply lines. Now, the term race to the sea refers to the struggle between German and Franco-British armies in September and October 1914 after the defeat of the German army on the River Marne. The British and French had pushed the Germans away from Ypres. At the end of October, the Germans almost broke the British line, but they overestimated British strength and failed to capitalize on their early successes. By mid-November, the fighting had almost ceased and the British and French held Ypres as a really important um, strategic location within the First World War. The Second Battle of Ypres, or Second Ypres, was from April to May 1915. Uh, the Germans wanted to take Pilkham Ridge and other surrounding areas. Gas was used and joined the, uh, the attack on Graben Staffel on 22nd of April. 6,000 French and colonial troops were incapacitated within 10 minutes due to chlorine gas. By the 25th of May, the Germans had captured all the high ground surrounding Ypres and the salient was fully formed. The rest of the conflict involved the British trying to remove the Germans from the high ground around Ypres and the Germans shelling the British below. The Germans began the systematic destruction of the city of Ypres. All civilians were evacuated and they were returned to just rubble and dust. So the salient, you can see a little diagram there. The salient is simply a bulge in the line that gives the defenders the advantage of being able to fire on those in the salient from three sides. At Ypres, the Germans had the advantage that most of their trenches were on high ground overlooking the wet lowlands held by the British. Okay then, so the third Battle of Ypres was June to November 1917. So in the spring of 1917, the Allies launched an offensive to break through German lines and the Battle of Passchendaele began on the 31st of July 1917. The idea was to get the Germans from the high ridge surrounding Ypres. Heavy rainfall during early August, though, turned the trench system into a sea of mud. The offensive gained little success before Haig called a temporary halt to operations due to the terrible conditions before resuming in September. Both sides suffered enormous casualties, probably around about 300,000 each. OK, so the fourth Battle of Ypres was from the 7th to the 29th of April 1918. Now, the Kaiser Spring Offensive began on the 21st of March 1918. It was Germany's final attempt to win the First World War before US forces arrived. The Germans captured Messines Ridge and were close to splitting the Allied line and leaving Ypres encircled. Now, Ypres was almost captured, but the Germans were a spent force and were exhausted. By the end of April, the Battle of Ypres had faded out. The front lines only left Ypres at the end of the war. The town had survived. So after the First World War, in 1919, Ypres was a wasteland, a memorial to the terrible suffering of the war. Chinese labourers, allied forces, German prisoners of war and the returning local population cleared the town and made the battlefield safe. Cemeteries were constructed and developed, and by 1921, plans for the design of the Menin Gate were being considered. Money from German reparations helped, and by 1925, the church, which is known as St. Martin's Cathedral, was beginning to be rebuilt. In 1934, work on rebuilding the Cloth Hall began following the original medieval plans. 
So you can see here today, Ypres is the centre of battlefield tourism. The first tourist arrived in years after the First World War with many ex-soldiers or families of soldiers that were killed who came to pay their respects. And you can see there the Menin Gate at Ypres and also the Cloth Hall at Ypres, which was completely rebuilt to the sort of medieval plans after the First World War. So some of the places that we're going to visit now, um, the Longuinness Souvenir Cemetery, um, Saint Omer was the um, or Saint Omer was the general headquarters of the British Expeditionary Force from October 1914 to March 1916. The cemetery takes its name from the triangular cemetery of the Saint Omer garrison, properly called the Souvenir Cemetery or the Cimetière du Souvenir Français, which is located next to the War Cemetery. There are 2,874 Commonwealth burials um, to the, of the First World War here. There are special memorials commemorating 23 men of the Chinese Labour Corps whose graves could not be exactly located. There are 403 burials from the Second World War. So we're going to the Huge Crater Museum as well. So Huge saw some of the heaviest fighting around the Ypres salient during the First World War. Heavy fighting took place in the grounds of the old chateau at Huge. On the 19th of July 1915, mines were blown by the British at Huge. 3,500 pounds of ammonial explosive and was the largest use at the time, which would then be dwarfed by the Loch Nagar Crater on the Somme in 1916. The crater then became an important tactical position that both sides would fight over for the rest of the war. The first use of the flamethrower took place here, spreading panic amongst the British. So we'll also go to the Huge Crater Museum. Um, by the summer of 1916, the Germans had recaptured all of Huge following the blowing of several mines under Canadian positions. The British retook it during the Third Epe in 1917, but were driven out during the Spring Offensive. For most of the First World War, Huge was the front line in the struggle between Allied forces and the Germans. The museum itself at Huge Crater contains many objects and artifacts in the First World War and gives a fascinating insight into the experience of the First World War. So we'll also go to Essex Farm Cemetery and Dressing Station. This is the site that inspired John McRae to write um, the very famous First World War poem in Flanders Fields, and it contains many burials and bunkers. There is a McRae memorial stone with a full text of his poem outside um, of the cemetery. Um, to the left of the cemetery, there is the advanced dressing station bunkers. There is a memorial obelisk to the 49th West Riding Division, who served along these canal banks for the longest continuous period and have many men buried here. Yes, yeah, so some key information about the Essex Farm Cemetery and Dressing Station. Um, so Essex Farm Cemetery was the site of an advanced dressing station, an ADS, where soldiers would be brought from the front line to receive medical treatment. Um, set up in 1915, treated many gas cases. In 1915, the bunkers were little more than holes in the ground, but they were then strengthened into concrete bunkers. Now, John McCrae was a Canadian officer who served here in 1915. On the 2nd of May, one of McCrae's friends, Lieutenant Alexis Helmer, was killed by a direct hit from an eight inch um, shell. This event, along with seeing more and more wooden crosses appear outside the advanced dressing station, inspired McCrae to write the most famous poem of the First World War in Flanders Fields. Now, the poem in Flanders Field was published in Punch magazine in December 1915. It's become a symbol of the sacrifice of the First World War. Another really um, interesting thing to look for is the grave of rifleman Valentine J. Strudwick. It's relatively easy to locate due to the number of crosses that are placed at it. Um, tragically, Strudwick uh, was only 15 years old and he's one of the youngest um, graves um, that, that we see out there. So there's the um, image of the grave of Joe Strudwick and there's an image of an ADS bunker that you'll both see when you're out there. OK, Sanctuary Wood or the Hill 62 Museum. There's a cemetery here and across the sacrifice. As you come to the open area of seating, you're going to be looking in the direction of the German front line. Now, Sanctuary Wood Cemetery is a concentration cemetery and did not exist during the actual First World War. In 1914, Sanctuary Wood was quite was a quite wooded area, as you might think. And um, towards the end of October 1914, it became heavily involved in the fighting. Now, it's called Sanctuary Wood because it gave sanctuary or a place of rest, if you like, to the British Army whilst they treated their wounded during this battle. The trees and position gave cover initially, but by November, the position was a magnet for artillery bombardment. This was all in 1914, of course. Now, there are 1,989 Commonwealth servicemen buried or commemorated in the cemetery. 1,353 of the burials are unidentified. The most famous burial is that of Lieutenant Gilbert Taylor. Reverend uh, P.B. Tubby Clayton named Talbot House a place for relaxation and religious observance after him, which we will be visiting there as well. There's a German burial here too, Hauptmann Hans Rosa, an Iron Cross holder and aviator. And outside the cemetery is a private memorial to Lieutenant Keith Ray. 
Now, the Sanctuary Wood Trench Museum, the museum was looked after by Jacques Shea, who died in July 19, 2014. His grandfather took the decision to preserve the land to what it was like after the First World War. The museum will help you understand a little more about trench warfare. Now, trenches developed in late 1914 when German General Erich von Falkenhayn ordered his men to dig continuous trenches, which would protect them from advancing British and French forces. The Allies built their own trenches when it was clear they could not break through German lines. The Germans had generally been able to choose their ground so they tended to have higher ground and had positions hidden from Allied sites. Some German bunkers were built out of concrete and even had electricity. Now the trenches you'll see at Sanctuary Wood give you a good idea about life in the trenches. These Allied trenches were on low-lying land which in the Ypres salient meant lots of water due to the clay soil and poor drainage. Frontline trenches were eight feet deep and six feet wide. Trenches were dug in zigzag shapes to prevent enemy soldiers shooting all the way down a trench if they captured it. Duck boards were placed at the bottom to protect soldiers from conditions like trench foot. Soldiers made small dugouts, which are known as funk holes, in the side of trenches to protect them from the weather and also from enemy fire. Here is a cross section of a typical First World War trench, so you can get an impression of that as well. So you've got the dugout, you've got the sandbags at the top, you've got um, the duck board, the fire step, the ammunition shelf where you keep your ammunition. ammunition. In front of the trench was known as the parapet. You can see there, then you've got your barbed wire and no man's land. So Hill 62 Memorial, the Hill 62 Sanctuary Wood Memorial site is located on top of a hill known to the British Great War soldiers as Tor Top. The top of the hill stands 62 metres above sea level, which gives it the name Hill 62, and it offers a commanding view of the surrounding area. OK, so on to Tynecott British Cemetery. Tynecott is the largest Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemetery in the world. If you look out over the fields, you can see Ypres in the distance and you are looking at the battlefield of the third Ypres. There are 11,953 burials, 70% of which are unknown. The name Tynecott comes from the fact that during the third Ypres, the 50th Northumbrian Division fought here and gave some nearby cottages this name. From 1917, this position was occupied by the Germans and was heavily fortified. There are two pillboxes in the cemetery. There were five or six here in 1917. And a third pillbox was incorporated into the Cross of Sacrifice at the suggestion of King George V. Now, going around the cemetery can be a really overwhelming experience and you're bound to feel very emotional. So it's a good idea to try and pick out some individual graves to read about. At the back of the cemetery is the Tynecott Memorial, which lists the names of those British soldiers who fought in the salient between August 1917 to the end of the war and whose bodies were never found and so they have no grave. Originally, all those without a grave were to be listed on the Menin Gate, but it ran out of space. There are 34,927 names listed on the memorial panels. And you can see there are some images and an aerial view of Tynecott as well. So we'll also get to the Langemark German Cemetery. Now, it's a really powerful visit and a highly important aspect of the Battlefields Tour. Langemark shows you the difference, I suppose, between winning and losing the war. And um, so they're very different, the German cemetery here. In a small rectangular space near the entrance of the cemetery is a burial pit known as the Kamerade and Grab, which means the Comrade's Grave. And it contains the remains of 24,917 German soldiers. The total number of burials here is 44,292. Now, the British handled the burying of German dead until 1925 at Langemark German Cemetery. In 1925, Germany and Belgium signed a treaty, which meant in 1929, Germany took over the handling of the cemeteries. About 3,000 of the burials here of student volunteers who died in the Battle of Langemark um, in October and November 1914. Now, this was used as a propaganda tool by Hitler and the Nazis after the First World War as part of something called the stab in the back myth, which was the untrue myth that Germany hadn't been properly defeated in the First World War. Hitler visited here in 1940, believing he had overturned German defeat in the First World War by his actions in starting the Second World War. During um, the Third Reich, 11th of November became Langemark Day. Um, Third Reich being the sort of period of Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1945. Hitler often in his speeches referred to the slaughter of the innocents at Langemark and his rise to power and his rule in Nazi Germany. So another point of interest is the four morning figures that you can see there um, by Emil Krieger, the sculptures. Now, the Menin Gate, uh, we'll go to the Menin Gate in the last post ceremony. Um, every night at eight o'clock in the evening, the last post ceremony begins at the Menin Gate. It's a memorial to the missing of the salient and the last post. 
During the First World War, British soldiers heading to the northern and eastern parts of the salient left Ypres by way of this break in the ramparts across the bridge and towards the front line. So most British soldiers would have passed through um, this. Um, obviously, the, the gate was, was built like this after the First World War, but they would have passed through this land on their way to battle. So every day since 1928, aside from four years of German occupation, just before eight in the evening, traffic is stopped from, from passing through the Menin Gate. Buglers march into the road and face the town, and the last post is played and wreaths laid. The exhortation or revel is then played. It's a hugely moving few minutes. Now, sometimes people do applaud at the end of the ceremony, um, but don't do this um, if you hear people doing this because it's not really an appropriate thing to do. It's a really powerful experience to go to the Menin Gate and to um, go to the last post ceremony, and we'll definitely be one of the most memorable experiences that you have on the battlefield tour. So the Menin Gate was declared that a memorial to the missing of the salient was important after the First World War. The site is chosen for its symbolic importance as the passage through which soldiers travelled on the way to the front. The Menin Gate was designed by Sir Reginald Blomfield and is inscribed on the names of 54,332 men who died or are missing up to the 15th of August 1917. When Field Marshal Plumer said to his to relatives in attendance in 1927, he said, he is not missing, he is here. And this is an important way for, for people to remember their loved ones that died in the First World War. The case will also be visiting the town of Popperange, uh, which is um, to the west of Ypres. Uh, um, Popperange, or Pop as it was known as, was the epicenter for the rest of the First World War soldiers, who were sometimes known as Tommies, and recuperation for those in the salient. So it's eight miles west of Ypres and was, for the most part, out of range of German guns. Vital supplies were stored here. There were officer clubs, saloons, uh, gambling activities, and lots of other things going on in Popperange during the First World War. One of the places that we'll go to is Talbot House Museum, which was set up as a spiritual retreat by the Reverend Neville Talbot. Talbot House, or Toc H, as it was known in Army signaler terms, opened on the 11th of December 1915. It was supposed to be a place of calm and quiet contemplation and respite for exhausted soldiers. No rank was acknowledged and men and officers mixed freely. The house was named after Neville Talbot's brother Gilbert, who was killed in 1915 and was buried at Sanctuary Wood. The dark side of Popperins during the First World War, there were 346 military executions of British and Commonwealth troops by their own forces. They were largely carried out on soldiers who had deserted their posts or those accused of cowardice. For example, Private James Crozier was only 16 when he was um, shot at dawn. The evening before execution, a chaplain would visit the condemned uh, person, man, and on the morning, the man would be given lots of room and then would be led out to face a firing squad. Many of those, of course, shot at dawn would have been suffering from mental illnesses, from post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and obviously it shows the very different viewpoints that we have nowadays to then about mental health and uh, things like post-traumatic stress disorder. We didn't really have much understanding of that back during the First World War. We'll also go to Lichsenthoek British Cemetery, which is a cemetery built on the site of several casualty clearing stations. It's the second largest cemetery in the area, 10,784 burials, 7,332 are British. Other Commonwealth nations have soldiers buried here. There are also German, American and Chinese burials here. The farm here was used by the French as an evacuation hospital in 1914, with the British establishing a casualty clearing station in 1914, and the French used the site from 1918. Now, there was a railway line at the back of the cemetery, which would have brought many injured soldiers here. Many who came to the casualty clearing station were very badly injured and there was a cemetery here from 1914. Now one thing to really look out for is that staff nurse Nellie Spindler is one of only two British female First World War casualties buried in Belgium. She was from Wakefield in West Yorkshire. On the 21st of August 1917, she was working um, as a, casual, a casualty clearing station in Brandhock when it came under fire from German artillery. Nellie was buried with full military honours. There are also uh, many Chinese graves at the Lichston Thok Brick Cemetery. Um, many of those actually died from Spanish flu. Many Chinese labourers were employed to clear up the battlefields after the war. The grave of Private William Baker is here. He was shot at dawn. There used to be many Americans buried here, but most American soldiers were killed in conflict, had their bodies repatriated, which means that their bodies are taken back to America. Any US soldier killed in active duty has the right to be buried at Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, DC. So visiting the um, First World War battlefields is a really important way of remembering the First World War. What better way to finish our video by reading John McRae's poem In Flanders Fields. In Flanders fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. 
we are the dead, short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from falling hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high, if we break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Thank you very much for listening and I hope that gives you lots of information to help you to get the most from our First World War battlefields trip. Thank you very much. Bye bye.